This is the full-on beer garden physics deep dive into high tensile bolts and high tensile bolted joints, how they really work, and clearing up a few misconceptions from our initial toe in the water on this yesterday when we talked about that tow bar on the Ranger that failed and cracked the chassis. So you might want to go back and check out that, but if you've ever harboured any aspirations about rebuilding an engine or bolting up a tow bar or bolting up a bull bar or things of this nature, then this is the Bolt University course for you. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. Okay, so yesterday we did that story on the Ranger that had an ARB rear bar fitted and essentially it cracked the bottom edge of the back of the chassis rail because clear as day, you can see from the photographs, the bolts just weren't done up properly. They were never done up properly. And despite being in service for three years and only towing an 1800 kilo trailer, and despite having two or three services where one of the jobs that the customer paid for was, you know, having the chassis bolts all checked and quote unquote tightened, uh, didn't actually work out that well. Okay, and this is a bit of a disaster because the dealership is kind of ducking it. Now, I do try and follow most of the comments most of the time on the channel. Sometimes there's just like tsunami of work and tsunami of comments and I can't keep up. But I was following the comments pretty closely yesterday and I would like to thank you in particular if you unleashed the fingers on the keyboard with some practical coalface experience in the design automotive engineering universe. There was one particularly good comment from a dude in the mining industry who said that most of the damage to the things that they bolt up to their off-road mining trucks is caused by not tightening appropriately. And there was another really interesting comment from a guy who said that, yeah, everything above M10 is under tightened and everything below M10 is over tightened mainly because people think that they've got these strange mental powers and they can just sense the right torque by hand. I can really relate to that because interestingly bolt manufacturers have done blind tests on people who think that and invariably they get it wrong and the torque wrench is always more accurate, okay? It's also important to pay uh, really close attention to the condition of the bolts when you tighten them up. Like, are they lightly lubricated or are they dry and what's the surface finish? Because it really does make a difference in the high tensile universe, okay? Uh, the rule of thumb there is normally it's the dry assembly torque spec that is listed in the documentations and you knock about a third off for light lubrication. So, you know, if you do put some oil on them, which is not a bad idea, frankly, you just knock about 30% off. So in the case of a fastener like this, which is an M12 socket head cap screw, grade 12.9, then it's about 100 uh, Newton meters, I think, the torque spec. And what you would do is reduce that to about 70 if you were doing it up lubricated, okay? So one of the things that I was a little depressed about yesterday is also in the comments there's this incredible characteristic of people being incredibly definite about their view and also dead wrong and we are going to talk about that and one guy in particular named Doug Campbell and I just want you to be aware that this is not a personal attack on Mr Campbell I'm really just here to talk about the facts. And there's also a safety dimension to this issue, all right? And it's pretty important if you're ever going to pull a tow bar off something and put it back on and how you're going to do that, the how really matters because that is a high tensile bolted joint design. And if you don't do it properly, by definition, those bolts will be too loose and you might risk damaging your chassis in the same way. And let's not forget that in extremis, if the chassis cracks and the tow bar falls out onto the road, the safety chains of a three and a half ton trailer are also attached to the bar. So all of a sudden, you've got this unrestrained, undirected trailer with a lot of acquired energy that's going to spend at least some of its time before the brakes do their thing traveling down here 
with potentially other members of the public coming this way. And I would not want to be a catalyst for that, frankly. I'd also suggest that if we can't discuss the facts like friggin' grown-ups, then the battle for advancement of humanity has been lost, right? So this is not a personal attack. This is about setting the record straight. Let's kick off. Sorry, mate, but I'm going to have to call you out on this one. High tensile bolts do work themselves loose. In all your engineering experience, I would have assumed you would have heard of spring washers. I'm pretty sure you will find there is ADR rules stating that spring washers must be fitted to all bolts of tow bars, bull bars, etc. Well, that's pretty interesting, Doug, and I do thank you for your interest in the report and for commenting, but we disagree, and frankly, the facts are on my side. And I really do want to set the record straight here. A, ADR rules. Yeah. There are compliance regulations for tow bars, okay? And that's because we don't want a bunch of backyarders out there dodging up their own tow bars in the shed and then bolting them up and sailing down the highway with three and a half tons attached to them because just going out there on a limb, that's not going to end well, dude. Okay, so there are compliance requirements, but interestingly, those compliance requirements are performance specifications. Like there's no requirement to have airbags in a car, okay? There's a requirement about the crash performance. And in practice, it's impossible to meet the crash performance of the hominid dummy without having airbags. But if they come up with some other miraculous method, they can do that instead, right? And what they do in practice, during the certification testing is they do a whole bunch of static load testing on tow bars. And if you pass, your design gets certified. And there's no way around this. Okay, so to test your hypothesis that spring washers must be fitted to tow bars, I had a look at a bunch of tow bars. Like, this is the assembly instructions, the parts page of the assembly instructions for the Trail Boss tow bar for Ford Ranger PX2 and Mazda BT50 cab chassis, all right? And you can see very clearly, if you download this document, that there's an item here for the washers, and they're all M12 flat washers, and there are no spring washers whatsoever referenced in this diagram, even though there is a compliance plate, and this tow bar has been tested. And it's not alone, because here is the unique 4x4 range of BT50, same thing. There's the flat washers, M12s again, and no spring washers in that parts list. And here's Heyman Reese, possibly the most familiar name to Australian vehicle owners when it comes to towing. Same thing there. M12 flat washer plane, there's 20 of them, all right? 10 bolts, 20 washers, like that. There's no spring washers in that list. And you are free to go online and download those instructions and confirm what I'm saying about this. So basically, I'd suggest that engineers aren't tradies, okay? I'm an engineer. I harbor no illusions that I'm not a tool maker or a mechanic, and I could learn a shitload from those tradies. I have learned a shitload over my life working with tradies in tool rooms. In fact, I started working for a tool maker when I was 15, and I was blown away at the skill, you know, measuring things down there at, th at, the, at the resolution of thousands of an inch, and saying, they were sort of, they would say to each other at times that, you know, you were half a thou out here. And I used to, I used to marvel at that, like half a thousandth of an inch. It's, you can't see it, and yet you can measure it, and you can cut metal up like that. And I guess that's what really got me hooked on the whole concept of engineering. Now, Duggo went on. If I had to do a rego inspection on this vehicle, I have failed others and would fail this one due to not having them installed. He means spring washers. I have lost count of how many bull bars I've seen rattle loose, all with high tensile bolts. Most of the ones have been fitted without spring washers. Maybe ARB did not supply them, just saying. Okay, so I'm inferring that Doug is a mechanic. Okay, and hashtag respect. Mechanics do good work 
and it's a very high consequence job if you get something basic wrong isn't it you forget to tighten up that sump plug or you don't do all the head bolts upright or you miss a conrod bolt in an engine rebuild something like that the consequences are profound like profoundly expensive okay so i'm not having a shot at mechanics generally and i'm not having a shot at doug about being strict on rego inspections either because safety inspections of vehicles are important we don't want dangerous vehicles driving around however in this case i would say that spring washers do not help there's a couple of pieces of evidence about that because you can look up all this documentation online about the design of high tensile joints and they don't say spring washers great idea okay you just saw the instruction pages like the parts specification pages in the instruction manual for fitting those three tow bars no spring washers okay spring washers don't help now this okay this is an m25 uh, hex head cap screw basically right it's a set screw and two flat washers there's a spring washer Here's the beautiful high precision nut. The fit on this is, it's so nice. I mean, high tensile fasteners fit together so good. If you've never, if all you've ever done is go to Bunnings and buy a few bolts that are galvanized, like these things are slick the way they're put together. Anyway, the spring washer, which hopefully you can see there, the spring washer is a misnomer actually, because it's less of a spring and much more of a counter-rotation chisel type device. And it's not meant to be used with a high tensile fastener, okay? You can certainly get spring washers for M25, no problem, okay? What happens is, when you look there and you see that discontiguity where it's broken in the spring, if we put a nut on there and if you can see that, when the nut tries to counter-rotate and undo itself in service, okay? This leading edge of the spring washer acts like the face of a chisel and attempts to bury itself into the nut just at the same time as the other chisel edge down there against the washer in this case attempts to bury itself into the washer and prevent any relative rotation between those parts. I don't know if you can see that so well, but you get the point, right? Those two edges of the spring washer are chisels and they attempt to deal with counter rotation. But they're not that useful in the high tensile universe because this is a bloody strong spring washer. It's a piece of very serious steel. And if I get my fencing pliers and lean on it with both hands, I can essentially flatten it straight out, okay? So that's a few tens of kilos worth of grip, right? It's not much of a spring. In other words okay what it is is it's a pretty good spring-loaded chisel for those nuts the only problem is and we're talking about an m12 fastener like that when you torque it up it's got the, the ones in question from yesterday were grade 8.8 .8 fasteners they carry about four tons of clamping force okay so you've already got the nut being clamped onto the job with four tons of clamping force and that is more than enough counter rotation because the mu, like the coefficient of friction between the nut and the job, the piece that's being clamped by the nut, is about 0.2, but let's say it's 0.15 or something. If there's, if there's four tons of clamping force, then there's already 600 kilos of counter rotation shear sort of influence acting on the nut, and that's, much more than a spring washer could ever bring to bear. So spring washers are useless in the counter rotation domain in high tensile joints. They just are. These are the facts calling and you don't have to like them, okay? Now, it's hard to imagine that, right? I get that it's hard to imagine that. Four tons worth of clamping force in a fastener seemingly so tiny, okay? I have difficulty imagining that you could hang two ranges from this set screw, but you could, and it would be perfectly safe. I wouldn't get under it like that, though. I'm conservative like that. I'd put about half a dozen fasteners in anything that was going to hold a weight like that. That's not advice about getting under one of these with four tons hanging on it. 
it's advice about how much weight they can handle. And I'd, I'd further suggest that just about everything in the applied engineering, mathematics and physics universe is counterintuitive. I don't feel like I'm standing on a ball that's 40,000 kilometres in diameter and I don't feel like the Earth is rotating around the sun and I don't feel like uh, the only thing stopping me from floating right now is an invisible force that's that's purely the result of the attraction between the mass of my body and the mass of the earth like you've got to be kidding it doesn't feel like that my gut tells me it's not that but you know science tells me it is and I'm going to go with science every time now if we get back to this chat there's a dude named Noel F who comments quite a bit and he engaged in this discussion as well and I kind of like what Noel had to say and it's illustrative of the robust debates that happen, okay? And I'm all for that kind of thing, but I also want to steer this ship towards the truth, okay? And I want to do that principally because, let's look at it like this, okay? If you're an engineer, or you're in a team of engineers working for Heyman Reese or ARB, or you're contracted by one of the car makers to make a tow bar, and you start with all of these design imperatives and you come up with a parts list and an installation manual that does not involve spring washers. That design does not need those spring washers therefore and putting them on is a mistake because it's not certified to operate like that and it's very dangerous for mechanics out there to have a better idea than the design that's been certified and compliance tested. So fitting a tow bar with spring washers, retrofitting them, is a poor idea in my view. So Doug, I would strongly advise you not to do that, mate, because if a tow bar comes out of the factory with no spring washers, it's because they're not needed. And putting them there could have some sort of negative influence on the design as a whole. Just saying. Noel says, hi Doug, I'm no mechanic so I really don't know what I'm talking about, but it occurs to me that conrod and main bearing bolts don't use spring washers and they don't work themselves loose. If they did, there would be cars littered all over the place with ventilated engine blocks. And I kind of agree with Noel's point as well, and to his credit, Doug got off his ass and responded to Noel quite nicely, I thought. He said, yes, I agree, you don't. Ironically, head bolts, conrod, main bearing bolts don't use spring washers because they are torque to yield bolts, inbuilt spring washers, so to speak. Comparing those to high tensile tow bar bolts is not a good argument. And to Doug on this one, right, I would say, yeah, it is a good argument because not all head, rod, big end bearing and associated bolts like that are torque to yield. Incidentally, a torque to yield bolt, you can always tell if you're dealing with one of those because what will happen is there'll be advice in the manual about assembly where you use a torque wrench and you do the bolt up to some preset torque spec. Let's say it's 75 newton meters or something. And then there will be advice to then rotate the bolt through some further angular displacement. And what that is designed to do is to go past what's called the yield point on the material uh, stress strain curve for the material, okay? And that delivers a higher clamping force using a smaller and lighter fastener. So the advantages of torque to yield bolts are they're smaller and that means in a complex part like a cylinder head, you've got more room to put, you know, water passages and ports and things of that nature, oil galleries, whatever, all through that casting and you don't have to have holes that are quite as big for the fasteners. So that's important. And in a thing that spins like a conrod, okay, using lighter fasteners is often better. But torque to yield bolts and high tensile bolts essentially do exactly the same thing. They stretch a certain amount so that they can deliver a preset designed amount of clamping force to hold highly stressed parts together. That's what they do. A torque to yield bolt is no more an inbuilt spring washer than a high tensile bolt, right? They're carrying a great deal of load. It's more than you can conceive of because they look pretty puny but they hold four tons kind of thing. 
and a torque to yield bolt that's that big will just hold a little bit more weight than that. The other critical thing about torque to yield bolts, okay, is that you can never reuse them once they've been tightened up. Because when something deforms plastically, you go past the yield point on the stress strain curve and then you get up here into the plastic domain, when you uh, reduce the torque and you let the load off the system, it, un it, it, it uh, releases itself again, but it doesn't come back to the same unstressed position as this, okay? It's a different thing once you take the torque off, is what I'm saying. So don't do that. If you've got torque to yield bolts, you undo them, put them in the bin, because they're no good to go again. The main disadvantage, right, with the torque to yield bolt is the cost because the material spec is pretty high and also the complexity of assembly. You've got to get it bang on and you have to measure the angle, whatever it is, 15 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees or 60, whatever. You've got to get that bang on because that's critical, okay? And it adds to the time cost of doing whatever repair job you're doing, whatever assembly job you're doing. Noel went on about this. Doug Campbell isn't tightening up a high tensile bolt to a particular torque setting more or less the same as tightening it up to a set amount of stretch. In both cases you're slightly stretching the bolt to apply a clamping force. What am I missing here? And to his credit Doug got back to him. Unfortunately he was also wrong. A high tensile bolt is designed not to stretch or very, very minimal. It is the opposite for torque to yield. The argument is how did a high tensile bolt come undone if it does not stretch? As I said earlier, it could be because it had no anti-vibration spring washer fitted. Okay, so up front, I'd say you have to lose the spring washer fascination because in high tensile joints, they don't help. All right, and the second thing is this designed not to stretch comment about these high tensile fasteners. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of how the engineering of bolts work, okay? What you should do is go to Google and Google yourself a thing called the stress strain curve for steel. You get this straight area like this, and then you get a little bump called the yield point. It's elastic here, it yields, it goes plastic on this curved region on the top, okay? And it's called stress and strain, but it really just means load and displacement. In the case of a bolt, it means clamping force and stretch because you don't get one without the other. They go together. You don't get the clamping force in any bolt without stretching it to some degree. Now, you might not be able to see the stretch. It's not a friggin' rubber band, but it is measurable. In fact, you can measure it with something like this, okay? This is what's called a dial indicator on a magnetic base. So you push the, the button, the magnet engages, you stick it to whatever you need to stick it to, and then you get this pointer here, and you engage it, in this case, with the head of a bolt, or the end of the stud, okay? And as you tighten the nut, this will measure in quite precise terms exactly how much that fastener is spreading. And the resolution of this is like 10 microns. I don't know if you can see that there, but it'll measure 10 microns, okay, which is 10 one thousandths of a millimetre. You can also use a dial indicator like this for measuring the run out on things like chucks on uh, drill presses, or you can dial in uh, something that you're putting in a four-jaw chuck in a lathe if you need precise orientation there. You can find the high spots and tighten them up and undo the corresponding jaw on the other side, and you use a dial indicator to tell you what you're looking at down there in the micron sort of domain, or the tens of microns domain, which is pretty precise machining, but they do it all the time. And also, on a milling machine, you know, if you're setting up a block and you need to do precise operations and things Things of that nature, you know, a, a dial indicator is an invaluable piece of equipment to show you things that you can't see, basically. It's like a micrometer on the end of a stick kind of thing, and you really can't see much movement there, but you can see the needle, needle moving a bit. Most of the movement that you can see there is just this rotating in my hand while I push it. Anyway, you can absolutely measure the stretch on a bolt like this by screwing a nut down onto it, okay? until it gets to, let's say, the job, and then 
cranking it up with the point of the dial indicator sitting on it and stuck to something else and then you just measure how much the stretch is and in fact that is one of the most reliable ways to get the right clamping force out of the fastener because it takes all the frictional aspects of the engagement that are inherent in a torque measurement and it throws it away and just concentrates on what you care about which is the stretch that delivers a known amount of clamping force because you know the material property of the fasteners all right now torque to yield bolts high tensile bolts, the stretch is critical and the best barometer of stretch that's available in a mechanics workshop is generally this. So you've probably seen one of these, it's your basic calibrated torque wrench, all right, it was calibrated when it was made, it hasn't been calibrated for a while now. Now this one will go, wait, for, wait until you get old, okay? You can't see anything up close. This will go in uh, foot pounds up to 155 foot pounds or in Newton meters it'll go up to 210. So we'd be in the middle of the range at about 100. You screw it up, it's got a uh, vernier type scale on it here, you just screw it up to whatever you want to 100, then you lock it off with this nut at the end. And don't try and be Yoda, okay? Use a torque wrench. They go click at the torque setting if you haven't seen one. They're not that expensive either these days, nothing is. You can get a reasonably high quality half inch drive torque wrench that'll do all of those M12, M8, M10 sort of fasteners. It won't be that expensive. And it really is a good investment, okay? I would suggest that it's important to realize that mechanics have their place, right? They really do, and they do such good work. And if you can find a good mechanic, he's worth his weight in unobtainium, right? He really is. but it's a mistake for mechanics to think they're engineers, just the same as it is for engineers to harbour some delusion that they're mechanics, all right? And how this works in Tobarville with high tensile bolted joints is that the torque setting really matters. And so do the washers, these three millimetre thick washers that they typically use to spread the load with tow bars and stop this phenomenon of embedding, all right? And going and changing the design arbitrarily by saying, oh, there's no spring washers on this, and I've seen so many tow bars and bull bars come loose, and none of them had spring washers. Correlation is not causation, dude. I would suggest, respectfully, that the reason they haven't had spring washers is because they're not designed with spring washers in the first place, and that's why they're not there, and they're not going to help if you put them there. What helps? is having the fasteners tightened up to the proper spec. It is by far the best hedge against undoing in service. And it doesn't hurt to get the torque wrench out occasionally, once a year or something, and just check that they're still up to the preset, the, the specified tightness, okay? And if you're wondering how this works, right, with the bolts and the tension and all of that stuff, in the domain of engineering, what you start with is what are the loads, okay? What are the loads on a tow bar? What are the expected dynamic loads? So let us get a prototype together and let's go out there with the heaviest trailer on our test track, so it's not a public road, and we'll put a, a, an even heavier trailer in place and we'll put all these strain gauges all over our rig and we'll actually figure out what the loads on a tow bar are and then we're going to figure out how to make the tow bar strong enough to withstand the loads and then we're going to figure out what the spec is on the chassis of the vehicle in the case of a ladder frame you okay and then we've got to figure out how to join them together without breaking the chassis kind of important and then we've got to figure out how much clamping force is required to stick the tow bar to the chassis reliably. And that's where Balti Boy comes in, okay? We figure out how much clamping force is required, and then you look up the strength of the bolts in a table and go, well, how many bolts are we gonna need to do that job? I'm oversimplifying it a bit here because you know, you gotta come up with the orientation of the, bo the bolts and all the different influences working on them. But really, in high tensile world, it's all about the clamping force to prevent the relative movement of the parts. And on this one, Doug, I would have to thank you for your engagement, but I am critical of the comments you made. And I think it's pretty dangerous to dick with a certified design and arbitrarily just 
advocate putting spring washers in because A, they won't fix the problem and they could concentrate the loads in unknowable ways on some of the parts. I don't know. I'd have to look at individual designs and do actual analysis and I'd need proper resources to do that. But it's always a safe bet not to dick with a certified design. And I guess if you come away with only two things from this particular video, and I hope I've been sufficiently respectful to you, mate, I really do. You're just wrong, okay? And that's about the facts. It's not about the personalities or any of that stuff, mate. And it's about safety out there on the road. So if you only come away from two things, with two things from this video, number one would have to be don't dick with a certified design. And number two would have to be Spring washers are okay in sort of low stress environments where you want to prevent arbitrary undoing of things like covers on machines and stuff like that. But in an actual high tensile design joint application, they're about as useful as tits on a friggin' bull.